this door begins a journey. Beyond it lies another dimension. You've just entered the fifth dimension. We are talking about this other world that exists. It's, it's another dimension, another kingdom where God is and where there's a battle against good and evil and a world that affects your life and mine and our world every day. Much of it we don't even know or understand what's going on, but we experience some of the touches of it in our lives, and we hope to see that all summer long as we think about a supernatural summer of studying many of the things that we just don't talk about very much, but are as real as anything in this existence. We welcome you today. My name is Tom. I'm one of the pastors, and today we're going to talk about angels. We're going to see how much God loves us by the way he works even through his angels in our lives. And I hope before we're through, you will understand and walk out of here more confident than when you came in that God is with you, and he will never leave you, and he'll be there for you in very, very special ways. When you talk about angels, it's kind of interesting because we get a lot of weird ideas about them because we watch too much television and see too many movies, you know, and look at really too many pictures about what angels are supposed to look like. So let me give you some examples. First of all, a lot of people think that angels are women with British accents because of a series that was on a few years ago called Touch by an Angel. And then if you go to movies a few years ago, you met John Travolta, who was Michael, and he was an angel in this movie, and he was a beer drinking and a kind of a, you know, one of these wife beater wearing kind of angels. And so some people think that's what they're like. And then if you spend too much time at Christmas watching the classic uh, A Wonderful Life, you get the idea that, you know, when bells ring, angels get their wings and all that nonsense. And uh, yet people love that stuff. And then another picture that we have of angels are these naked little fat, bald-headed uh, babies that kind of play harps and float around uh, on clouds. And that's another image that people have. And then some think that when their loved ones die, that they go to heaven and they become their guardian angels. It's kind of like grandma's watching over me, you know. Well, I, I hate to burst any bubbles, but grandma's probably not watching over you, okay? Uh, as sweet as she may have been, she isn't uh, your guardian angel, Okay. So let's think about angels a little bit, because what we have to understand is angels are God's servants. They are supernaturally created beings created by God to serve Him and to bring glory and honor to Him. They're very, very powerful, because they can kill thousands of people just in one snap of their fingers, kind of. And yet at the same time, angels, as the Bible reveals to us, are so loving and caring and kind that they can protect a very small child. They also can come as, as appearance of human beings. Many times in the Old Testament and New Testament, angels appeared to people as human beings in bodily form, and they would talk to them, they would eat with them, they would stay with them. Angel, er, uh, Abraham and Sarah experienced that in the Old Testament. So did Lot in Sodom. And all throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament, there are all kinds of examples of that kind of thing happening. So we really want to study about angels and figure out who they are and what they do. Let me show you an interesting verse over in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 2. It says this, Do not forget to entertain strangers... For by so doing, some people have entertained angels without knowing it. I wonder, do angels do more for us, perhaps, than we even know? And without getting too weird and too mystical and too supernatural about it, are they really more involved in our lives than we may have thought? That's what we're going to study today and think about. Just before we do, we're going to take up our offering. And this is the time where we give back to God 
a part of what He's given to us because we love Him and we want to obey Him and we're so grateful for His goodness. And so those of us who are part of this church will give back our tithes and offerings. If you're our guest today, we are so glad you're here. We hope you felt very, very welcome and have already sensed some things from God in your life. And uh, all we are asking from you at this offering time is that communication card. If you'd put that in the offering plate, that would help us to get to know you, and we appreciate that opportunity so very, very much. So let's bow and ask God to guide us as we study and also to bless this offering for His glory. Thank you, Lord, for the way you lead in our lives. You've been so kind and good to us, and um, we are humbled by that. As we sing these marvelous songs about what a great God you are, and, and we talk about wanting to tell the whole world because we want to be salt and light to this world, I pray that you will help that to be true, even more so because of what we hear today and, and since May you be honored and glorified in all of uh, that which we yet are a part of today. We even thank you for rain because we know in a few weeks we'll probably be praying for it. So we thank you for it today. And we just thank you for your many blessings. We give this offering back to you in that spirit of praise and thanksgiving. And we honor you, Jesus, in your name. Amen. I think that angels look like they have white robes on that are pretty long. A miniature version of God with wings. Feathered big wings. One of dresses and floating. They have like a little circle thing on their head. Just a silver thing that's moving around and flying. But they still have um, like skin. It's just like a person. They usually have red hair. Most of them have, have long hair. Lots of angels have like curly hair and they have wings. I heard that like on a movie that every time a bell rings, an, a, a, a bell rings, an angel gets the wings. And they fly. So when they come out of heaven, they don't just go Wee! doink. And the wings are kind of carved and they look like they're kind of hard, but they're, but um, they're not. I think they just watch over Earth to see what's going on. They just sit up in heaven and like obey God and watch TV and play video games. Uh, and they get to just um, party and have some fun. Like they sing um, like high pitched songs, not the really rock and rollish ones. Like another one bites dust. They sing hallelujah, like really fast. Then they sing it slow, then fast again. I think they're usually girls, but sometimes both. God created boys and girls, and um, girls don't, um, boys don't just go to heaven because um, girls can too. I, but I think I do have a guardian angel. My dad told me they're like, God's helpers, they watch over you. When you pray, you pray for like 10 guardian angels and they stay like in your bedroom or in your house somewhere, and they make sure you're safe. Like once when I was about nine, I saw an angel right by my bed and like he was telling me what to be when I grow up. He was telling me to be a preacher. I, I think no, never all of them would come down. I think there would always be at least two up there. They keep bad things away from us, like germs, because they're with God. They're pretty perfect. All right. So uh, we are here to uh, dispel some myths. We all have a lot of kind of things we just worked up, and you hear things and movies, and you see things. You talk, hear people just talk about their this and that, their experiences. So what we want to do our best to do as, as we really venture, continue to venture into the Supernatural series is to share what we do know. Now, there will be times when I'll, uh, I'm happy to say uh, to your question, I, I don't know. There are a lot of things I don't know. Why does God do things when he does them, with who he does them? Why, when does he send an angel? Why does he send, there's some, I don't know. I'm not God. Turn to the person next to you and say, thank God he said that. <laughs> yeah, I'm not, I, there's a lot, there's things we don't know. But what we'd like to do is share with you what we do know from God's word. So angels, 
supernatural beings, right, created by God for God. Say that with me. Created by, by God, God for God. God. That's one thing we do know. Supernatural beings created by God <clears throat> for God. Now, we believe that they are really primarily are designed to do three things. Number one, if you're taking notes today, number one, they are worshipers. Angels are worshipers. Wherever you see it in the Bible, you see angels worshiping God the Father. You see angels worshiping Jesus. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 6 says, and when he brought his firstborn son into the world, God said, read it with me, let all of God's angels worship him. They are worshipers of God. Revelation chapter 5 verses 11 through 12, John is on the Isle of Patmos, and he writes these words. Then I looked again, and I heard the voices of thousands, and how many? Millions. millions. Another million. version says countless, thousands and millions, and countless angels around the throne of the living beings and the elders, and they sang in a mighty chorus. Read it with me. Worthy is the lamb who was slaughtered to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessings. Worthy is the lamb. Worthy. They are worshipers. Secondly, they are also warriors. Another reason I'm really not big on the fat baby uh, angel idea. Really not. These are warriors. Truly warriors. Not only worshipers, but warriors. In the book of 2 Kings, chapter 19, verse 35 says, uh, you need to go back, this is a great, it, by the way, I know I share this a lot, but I mean, you need to get into, your, uh, into the Old Testament. I mean, the Old Testament's great fun. You've got murder, mayhem, sex is like craziness in there. You know, it's just like nutty stuff going on. You've got to get into the Old Testament. But this is a great story where it says, the, uh, the night the angel of the Lord, that night the angel of the Lord went out to the Assyrian camp and he did what? He killed 185,000. That's some good reading right there, man. You, killed, destroyed 180,000. You need to find out the whys. You need to go to the book of 2 Kings and find that out. Revelation chapter 12, verse 7. Then there was a war in heaven. Michael, Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, against Satan and his angels. There is a war. We talked about it. We began last week. There's a supernatural battle. He said, Michael, the angel, was battling in the heavens against Satan and his demons. There is a battle. They are not only worshipers and warriors, but they are also messengers. If you're taking notes, you can write in there. They are also messengers of God. We see it throughout the Bible. They are messengers of God. Gideon, who was in a battle, and it, uh, he was scared. He was hiding. He was so scared he was hiding. And God sends an angel to him. And in Judges chapter 6, verse 12, he says, The angel of the Lord appeared to him and said, read it with me, Mighty hero, the Lord is with you. Man, what a message when you're hunkered down, when you're hiding away. Mighty hero, the Lord is with you. And I think probably the most well-known story of an angel as a messenger we find in the New Testament, right? Yeah. The book of Luke. Don't be afraid, Mary. Remember hearing this? Remember reading this? Mary, don't be afraid, the angel told her, for you have found favor with God, and you will receive and give birth to a son. And you will name him Jesus. They are worshipers. Worshipers. They are warriors. That we know. And we also know throughout Scripture, and it's exciting, we have more notes for you in the, in the back two pages of your notes. There's next steps where you can research even more. There's such exciting information in God's Word. But they are messengers, and you'll find messengers in the Old Testament and in the New cool stuff, isn't it? It's tremendous stuff. You know, you, you actually, there's a portion of Scripture that says that in heaven, there's a, a, it's either a class of angels or just angels that are assigned to be called cherubim and seraphim. And they're around the throne of God all the time. And throughout eternity, all these angels do is they sing, holy, holy, holy Lord, God Almighty, you are worthy. And they just sing that day and night because that's part of the honor and the worship and the glory that these worshipers give to God. And when you were reading that uh, 185,000 in one, one angel, 
just says an angel. It's a bad angel. It's a bad angel, man, bad dude. That might have been Michael, that, that John Travolta guy. I don't know, but uh, it reminds me of someone like that. Could have been. You think about that, and then messengers. You have to ask yourself, what are these angels doing all the time from another world, but yet involved in our world that's ministering to us? That's working in our lives. So we ask, what exactly do angels do? And there's a couple of things that come to mind immediately. One is, they give direction. Angels are used of God as his servants to give direction to you and me. We know that from many examples in the Bible. In the New Testament, there's one that's very relevant because you have Mary, the mother of Jesus, teenage girl probably, and her fiancé Joseph... And Joseph finds out that Mary is pregnant. And in that day, uh, it was a great shame. And he was preparing to, the Bible says, put her away. In other words, to break off the engagement and to separate from her because it looked like there had been fornication. It looked like there had been some hanky-pank going on, and he wasn't going to be any part of that and the Bible says over in Matthew 1.20 that God sent an angel to give guidance to Joseph and Mary. Notice how we read it. As Joseph was considering, what in the world am I going to do? My fiance is pregnant. I didn't do it. I'm not involved. I've got to do something here. An angel of the Lord <laughs> appeared to him in a dream to give him direction. And here's what the angel said. Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child within her was conceived by the Holy Spirit. In other words, she's not been immoral. You don't have to look at her as, as someone who's been fooling around. Here's what's happened. The Holy Spirit of God has planted the seed of God in her womb, and she is going to give birth to the Son of God who will take away the sins of the world. And that angel came to Joseph to give him direction. And there's another interesting illustration. It's, it's a very humorous one because in the Old Testament, there was a guy by the name of Balaam. And he, had, um, uh, 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 he, had, he was a servant of God. And, and he was wanting to go with the Moabite king and go into battle with them. And God said, don't you do it. That's exactly opposite of what I want for you. That's unacceptable. And Balaam kind of thought, you know what? I got a better idea than God. I think I'm going to go ahead and do it anyway. And we pick up the story over in Numbers 22, verses 21 through 34. Quite a bit of scripture, but I think this is really one of the most humorous stories in the Old Testament. It says, so the next morning, Balaam got up, he saddled his donkey, and he started off with the Moabite officials. But God was angry that Balaam was going, so he sent the angel of the Lord to stand in the road to block his way. In other words, God sent an angel to Balaam to give him direction, to say, don't go that way. As Balaam and his two servants were riding along, Balaam's donkey saw the angel of the Lord standing in the road with a drawn sword in his hand. It was interesting because the donkey saw the angel and Balaam didn't, as you'll see in this story. So the donkey bolted off the road into a field, but Balaam beat it and turned it back onto the road. Then the angel of the Lord stood at a place where the road narrowed between two vineyard walls. And when the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, it tried to squeeze by that angel. And in the process, it crushed Balaam's foot against the wall. So Balaam beat the donkey again. And then the angel of the Lord moved farther down the road and stood in a place too narrow for the donkey to get by at all. This time, when the donkey saw the angel, it just laid down under Balaam. In a fit of rage, Balaam beat the animal again with his staff. I mean, where is Peter when you want them, you know? This guy's beaten living stuffing out of his donkey. Okay. 
Then the Lord gave the donkey the ability to speak. Now, this is amazing because here's a donkey talking to his master. And he says, what have I done to you that deserves your beating me three times? Now, that's amazing enough, but what's really humorous is that Balaam talks back to his donkey. (laughs) And he said, you have made me look like a fool. If I had a sword with me, I'd kill you. And then the donkey speaks to him again. He says, but I am the same donkey you've been riding all your life. Have I ever done anything like this before? And Balaam says, well, no. And then the Lord opened Balaam's eyes. Now here's where he's giving direction. And he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the roadway with a drawn sword in his hand. And Balaam bowed his head and fell face down on the ground before him. And the angel said, why did you beat your donkey those three times? Look, I have come to block your way because you are stubbornly resisting me. Three times the donkey saw me and shied away. Otherwise, I'd have certainly have killed you by now and spared the donkey. Then Balaam confessed to the angel of the Lord, I have sinned. I didn't realize you were standing in the road to block my way. See, he didn't see the direction that God was trying to give him through that angel. A stupid, dumb donkey did, but Balaam didn't. He said, I have sinned. I will return home if you are against my going. You know, as I read that, I wondered, how many times... Does the Lord, I mean, he gives us some wisdom, so we should use that, but how many times does the Lord send angels to give messages to us in our heart and our mind, if not through somebody else, to say, don't go this way, don't do that, don't get involved in that, it will end up messing you up horribly. Many times people come and they try to get us to hear their wisdom. Many times it seems like there's just a big roadblock right in our way. Many times things just will not work out no matter what we try. And in our stupidity sometimes we just keep beating our donkey saying, go on, go on, I want to do it, I want to do it. And think of the consequences we pay when God over and over and over again tries to say, don't Go here. This is the way. Go this way. And I think many times God sends angels. And uh, they may be angels unaware that we're unaware of. Maybe even people that he's using to give us his message. And I think we need to be aware of that and listen to that and not buck that too hard, not beat that message away from us. So first of all, the angels give direction. There's another thing angels do. They often give us protection. It's very clear in the Bible, and I think you've probably seen it in your life. Uh, I'm often asked, does everyone have a guardian angel? And I would say to you, nowhere in the Bible does it say that everyone has a guardian angel. But it does say this over in Psalm 91, verses 11 through 12. It's very interesting. It says, for he, God, will order his angels to protect you wherever you go. That means wherever you go, you've got some godly influence watching over you, seeking to protect you, and not only guide you, but keep you from any harm. He will send his angels to protect you wherever you go. They will hold you up with their hands so you won't even hurt your foot on a stone. As I was thinking about that, I was thinking, I wonder how many times God has been there in our lives when we don't even understand it. We may never realize it until we get to heaven, but he was doing all kinds of things supernaturally to protect us, to care for us, to keep us from any kind of evil. Um, I I thought of an example in my own life, and that is of, uh, of driving. I wonder how many times when we're driving, God protects us, you know? Uh, I, I know that, and please don't be afraid to drive with me. I mean, Jeff is, but don't you be afraid to drive with me, okay? 
I am scared. <laughs> uh, but I will tell you that there are times when I have driven that I know I have fallen asleep. I don't know if you've ever experienced that. You're probably much better drivers than I am. But I have experienced where I've fallen asleep. And I know I've been asleep. I hope it's just been for a second, but it could have been longer, and yet I'm still on the road. That was because I screamed. <laughs> That too. But, and God used you. You see, you were a messenger of God right at that point. But the thing is that um, how many times when we've been driving our car has God caused us to have to stay a little longer at a stoplight than we wanted? And maybe, I don't know, not trying to get too mystical or weird here, but maybe that's so that we don't have some car just crash into us right down the road. How many times has God protected us when we're driving and given us an ability to stop a vehicle soon enough to where we weren't injured or killed Amen. or others? I mean, God's always at work for you and me. <clears throat> we just don't always see it because he's got so many angels and he's got so much love and he's got so much care and so much involvement in our lives. He's there protecting, caring, working. Think of how many times God has probably protected us from some evil person or evil thing or evil involvement in our life that we would have gone right toward if we hadn't been stopped some way or if that evil influence hadn't been stopped some way. Think of, uh, think of our children and how much we've prayed for them. I mean, we pray for our children all the time, even to this day, and they're growing up, and one of them's grown up and one's growing up. And uh, we pray all the time, God, protect them from any evil person or evil thing and prepare their ministry and their mate for them so that you can bless them and use them for your glory. Amen. But how many times has God been involved in protecting from any evil influence or evil person or evil thing in our lives, our children's lives? And uh, I think we just need to every day trust him. And not get mystical about it, but just rest and enjoy the faith and confidence we can have in God and believe that he cares about us more than we care about ourselves and that he has his angels involved in our lives to give direction and to give protection. So we are going to share the things we do know, right? These are many things we do know. There are a lot of things we still don't know. The answer might be, well, why doesn't he always intercede? Why isn't he always sending an angel? I don't know but I knew though that he does. Now, I'll tell you a quick story. Just after we moved here, Kath and I moved here, pre-children era, we were driving home on the 235 freeway. We were headed west, and back then, this was before the freeways were wide and all, and pretty much at 5 o'clock, the freeway always stopped right on top of the 8th Street Bridge. Always stopped, every day, always stopped. I don't know if, it's, if you're still driving this way, if it still stops, but at 5 o'clock, it stops. And sure enough, we're driving home, and it what? It stopped. Sure, it stopped. I remember it was 5.03 when we stopped. But let me fast forward for you, and everything kind of goes into slow motion as you go back to think about this. But I remember us slowing down, and then the traffic came to a quick stop. And I hit the brakes, and I did what normally we do, right? When you hit the brakes fast, I looked up in the rearview mirror. And I saw, as our car started tipping forward, I saw a gray van in front of us, and I looked in the rearview mirror, and I saw cars behind us starting to do this behind us. And now I'm sp speaking of it as though it's slow and it happened that fast. And we stopped behind this gray van, and we had three cars, and we heard it, boom, 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 into us. Now, I think what happened is I went uh, lights out there for a moment because I remember going black. But then I remember the lights coming back on. And this is what I remember. I got out of the car, and there were probably 30 feet of black skid marks because I had both feet compressed on the brakes because the one thing I remembered was gray van in front, cars coming fast behind, and I had both feet pressed down. But in that fast, and this didn't happen over five minutes. This happened that fast. We got out of the car, we saw that we had slid 30 feet, but we had not hit a gray fan in front of us. In fact, there was no traffic in front of us. And I couldn't help but say, God, thank you. And to this day, I don't know that, that an angel arrived. I have to believe that it was God's intervention in our lives because we were on stopped freeway. There was a gray van right in front of us, and one second later, we're 30 feet ahead. 
but yet we didn't hit anyone. Does it always happen? Nope, in four other car accidents. Didn't work out so well. But was that God at work? Was there an angel there? I don't know. But do I believe that he could have? Absolutely. We see it all throughout Scripture. If you're taking notes, again, the third thing is that angels can minister God's love, healing, and power to us. Man, that is, that is beautiful. He can minister his love, healing, and power to us. So let me close with just two more stories. The first one we'll find is Jesus. Uh, this is, you'll, you'll find this in the book of Matthew chapter 4. You can go back and you can reference this and, and read it this week. Jesus um, has gone on a 40-day fast, so he hasn't eaten and he hasn't had any water in 40 days. So he's mentally exhausted, emotionally fatigued, physically exhausted. And the Bible says that Satan is tempting him over and over, worship me, follow me. Oh, well, but you can jump off of this. Satan try to make him jump through hoops to say, worship me, and I'll give you everything that you see. Of course, Jesus says, not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. And the verse I want to draw your attention to is verse 11, where it says, Then the devil went away, and read this with me, and angels came and took care of Jesus. And angels came, another version says, and angels came and ministered to Jesus. That word minister in the original language means to be an attendant, to wait on, or to minister as unto a friend, to take the hand of to care for, to embrace, to minister to as a friend. There's another story of Jesus. And often you hear this story taught around Easter. And Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane. And now we are hours away from him being brutally murdered and tortured and murdered. The Bible says it was so intense, it was so emotionally draining, so spiritually intense that he was sweating drops of blood. Jesus, worn out. In Luke chapter 22, verses 42 and 43 says this. Jesus, after being completely worn out, says, Father, if you're willing... Please take this cup of suffering away from me. Yet, yet, I want your will to be done, not mine. Read this with me. Then an angel from heaven appeared and strengthened him. Strengthened him. You may be worn out in your marriage. There may be an angel strengthening you through this time. You're exhausted in relationships in your family. There may be an angel strengthening you at this time. Do I know for sure? No, I don't know for sure. But I've seen it over and over and over and over and over again. Remember what we said last week. What we see with these eyes, this isn't all that's going on. There is a spiritual world and there is a spiritual battle in this world. There's a spiritual battle for your soul. Spiritual battle for your soul right now. In this room, there's a spiritual battle for your soul. God, creator of the universe, lover of each one of us, is calling us and drawing us toward him. And Satan's casting doubt in your mind. He's saying, this stuff is bogus. There's nothing to this. You don't need to follow. These people are just stupid. These are just blind sheep. Just follow him. These people don't know anything. You can't prove anything in that book. He'll tell you every lie he can tell you. There's a spiritual battle right now for your soul. Now you may say, Jeff, you know what? I'm done with a spiritual battle. I choose to follow Jesus. And in here in just a minute, we're going to put a prayer on the screen. I'm going to ask you to pray with me. That's not like this whole oh, simple fix. Let me just throw this out there. No, this is an intent of your heart. You choose to follow Jesus. You say, you know what? If you pray to receive me, if you confess your sinfulness, that you're far from me and choose to follow me, I will forgive you of your sins. And I've prepared a place in heaven for you. But there's a spiritual battle right now. There's also something in you that says, no, don't. Don't pray. Don't believe. Don't trust. Don't follow. And on the other side, God is saying, will you trust me? Will you have faith? Will you trust me and follow me? Would you put that prayer on the screen? Just, I want everyone right here to read it out loud 
with me. And if you believe this from the very depths of your heart, with all of your heart, the Bible says when you confess your sins and choose to follow Jesus, the Bible says you will be born again. You will spend eternity in heaven. If you pray this prayer, you mean it with all of your heart, then outside the atrium, we'd love to give you a Bible. We'd love to get you on track. We'd love to connect you into a small group, into a brand new study to help you understand God's Word. And it's begin spiritually growing and to begin your spiritual journey. So I'd like to have everyone just do me a favor. Stand with me if you would. Stand with me right now, and I want you all to pray this out loud with me. Say it like this. Heavenly Father, I'm a sinner who needs a Savior. Jesus, save me. Forgive me. Make me brand new. Fill me with your spirit so I can follow you. I believe you died for me so I could live for you. Thank you for your life. Now you have mine. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. We believe that if you pray a prayer like that with all of your heart, that you have been born again. And we celebrate that with you. Pray with me. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for those who have chosen to trust you and follow you. Father, thank you for interceding in our lives in supernatural ways. Thank you for the strength, for messages. Father, thank you for implanting your very spirit into us as followers of yours so that we can hear you, follow you. In Jesus' name. Now look at me as well. Let me just share with this before you go. Inside your notes, there are next steps for you. You want to learn more about angels? We have already given you the notes that you can go back this week. Sit down with your mate, with your children, with your grandchildren. Take 10, 15 minutes a day. Take it step by step, paragraph by paragraph, and enjoy the journey of learning more of God's Word. If you need a Bible, we'll get one for you. I look forward to seeing you back next week as we talk about Satan and his demons. God bless you as you go. More than just a